Dr. Richard Criley is a professor emeritus of horticulture at the University of Hawaii, having worked there from 1968 to 2010. He has conducted research on tropical gingers, heliconias, bird of paradise, proteas, virea rhododendrons, bougainvillea, dendrobium orchids, various lay flowers, and plumeria, as well as traditional floricultural crops, such as chrysanthemums and poinsettias. The focus of his work has often been the manipulation of flowering to improve availability of flowers during their off seasons. About 40 pounds ago, I had the opportunity to take classes from Dr. Criley, and so it is great to have him here today. So Dr. Criley will be sharing his 50 years of plumeria research. Dr. Criley, thank you for being here. Thank you, Glenn. Doesn't seem like it was 40 pounds ago. Well, it was about 40 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> the plumeria research actually began more than 50 years ago with one of our graduate student teaching assistant research associate named Ted Shin. When I joined the Department of Horticulture in 1968, the department chair, Dr. Donald Watson, told me that he would like to have plumeria flowers available during the winter months for the tourist trade. Well, that was a challenge that <clears throat> I was interested in, in pursuing, but there was no funding. So over the 50 years that I've been involved here, the funding has been mostly out of pocket and cockroached on other plants. Initially, the research plot in which we grew our plants was funded by, Dr. Donald, by Mr. Donald Angus, the Kama'aina horticulturist of many years standing. And then his support was Jim Little, commercial nurseryman on the North Shore of Oahu, who has also assisted me over the years with uh, considerable uh, knowledge and inputs and grants. The research was originally started with Ted Chin. I have his uh, original accession book, and I still refer to it for when did we start growing this variety or that variety. Our plants were grown at the University of Hawaii's Waimanalo Research Station. And we have increased from the original plantings in the 1960s to plant materials that we've stuck in as recently as two years ago. Most recently, we have increased the amount of uh, space that we've allocated to species pl plumerias. And I'll get into that a little while later. This a portion of Ted's uh, accession. This portion of Ted's accession book shows three accessions that were given to us in the early 60s by Dr. Frank Martin from Puerto Rico. And the San Germain cultivar, which is shown here, is one of those that is rust resistant, which is a trait that we would really like to get into our commercial. Uh, plumeria varieties. It's also very fragrant. Now one of the reasons for talking about plumerias is that they're well known for their use in lay and for the tourist trade this is an important characteristic. But plumerias are also uh, grown for the individual flowers which can be shipped and even used as individual flowers in uh, flower design work, corsages, and so forth. We also have plumerias being grown for shipment out as cuttings. You go online, and you'll find lots of cuttings available for sometimes rather exorbitant prices. Plumerias are native to the area of the Caribbean, Central America, and across for the Antilles Islands, uh, such as Cuba, Hispaniola, Jamaica, Puerto Rico and then the smaller islands uh, heading up from northern South America, the Lesser Antilles. We also have a few species from the northern coast of South America. So plumerias are not native to Hawaii, but they are a plumeria 
that has gone around the world and everybody thinks of Hawaii when they see them. Now in answering Dr. Watson's challenge to get plumerias to bloom during the winter months when there's a big tourist demand for them, we had to look at what was the photo period and temperature regime in Hawaii during the time. We have a comparatively short photo period uh, in the winter months, a little bit uh, over 10 hours, and during the summer months, a little under 14 hours. So with only a three hour time zone differ time difference, we didn't know whether we could manage plumeria flowering with photo period. Our temperatures are always pretty high, but we still get flower loss, pardon me, foliage loss during the winter months. And that's more likely due to the short photo periods than to the somewhat cooler temperatures. There are a large number of plumeria growers on the mainland, and during the winter months, they get a lot of cool weather as well as short temperatures, and they get dormant plants. One of the <coughs> initial approaches that we tried was to put lights on over our plumerias during the winter months. We had noticed that in the street lights, the plants retained their leaves. And so we thought this might be a key to keeping the plants growing. What we found was that lighting the plants during the winter months didn't help much in bringing on flowering. We also tried the use of reflective barriers. We put down aluminized plastic under the plants to reflect more light onto the plants. This actually brought on more flowers for us, but it didn't change the time of flowering. In the course of conducting our plumeria research, we characterized the development of the plumeria inflorescence from the initial, what we call stage one, about the size of your little uh, pinky fingernail, all the way up to full bloom. And in this experiment, we were using phosphorus to try to increase the number of inflorescences set on a plant. First few years, we didn't see much difference. And part of this is because our research site, Waimanalo Farm, has a lot of phosphorus in the soil, even though some of it's tied up. But over time, we were able to increase flower, uh, both shoot production and flower production with the increased use of triple 10-30-10 as compared with the normal 10-10-10 level of fertilizer. This experiment gave us a lot of information, not just on what the fertilizer requirements for plumeria might be, but also what their productivity was. <clears throat> we had six varieties that we were growing at the time, and these varieties then, Celadine, which is the most common uh, product producer, it's a yellow flower. You can see the celadine at the top with the highest percent of shoots with inflorescences. Then we had Donald Angus, Scott Pratt, and a white that was numbered 1841. Scott Pratt as the bottom one, fewer than 10 percent of the shoots would have inflorescences. But we did have good production on Donald Angus, and, a certain, and 1841, which itself was not a long season producer, but in the spring months when you need the flowers, we would count on that one for providing some good whites. Some of my other interests in, in research have been the use of growth regulators in flowering and plant manipulation. We tried out the cytokinin materials ranging from N6 benzaladenine and kinetin and one that was called PBA. Applied this to the cut ends of plumeria plants that had been pruned. And this stimulated a large number of buds to break and we got a lot more shoots 
from a uh, pruning cut. And of course, the larger the stem, the more buds that we had that were likely to break out and produce shoots. So you can see that in the upper right-hand corner graphic. And some illustrations. Besides using the spray of the cytokinin, we also used it embedded in the lanolin paste that was put on the shoot tip, or pardon me, the cut stump of a pruned stem. And you can see on the right-hand side the response of many new buds beginning to develop. This has impact then for increasing the number of shoots on a plant. And also, if you're going to prune a plant to keep it low enough so you can harvest the flowers, you can have more stems at a lower level. We have tried other growth regulators on plumerias in the course of our work, uh, taking dormant stems, treating them with auxins, cytokinins, gibberellins, and the only growth regulator that stimulated breaking dormancy was the gibberellic acid. On the right-hand side of the screen, you see the impact of ethophon, which is an ethylene-releasing compound. It caused total defoliation on the plant. And the, the interesting thing about defoliating the plant is with no leaves, it doesn't perceive that there's a short photo period. So during the winter months, when it would normally be uh, dormant and no foliage, if it's warm enough, it'll start to grow again. So we capitalized on that with some research. Defoliating plants with ethophon at different times. The vertical axis shows the different times that we started defoliation and took measurements. And the early treatments that were done in October produced flowers for us much earlier, as you can see in the yellow, yellow line. We had flowers by mid-December when the other treatments were not going to set, show us flowers until late January. And so that lower yellow line is the key. Defoliate your plants early enough that they still have the warm temperatures and they will come into bloom in response to the warm temperatures of winter. And they just push out the flower clusters. So it's not stimulating initiation. We actually found that the flowers are, are initiated during the summer months, basically in July and August. This graphic is difficult to read even if when you have it blown up as we have in front of us here. What it shows is the stage of growth in the first, uh, first time of the treatment. And you can see what looks like a, a wave moving across as you go from the left hand to the middle to the right hand graphic. And so the earlier the treatment, which is the top, the sooner we got the flowers into January, and that was a time when we could still make use of them for the tourist trade. So I did finally succeed in, in reaching Dr. Watson's goal of getting winter flowering for plumerias. Fortunately, he was still alive at the time to learn of it, though he passed away not too long after. We've also looked at the different varieties of plumeria in terms of how long can they last. We've heard about the two months of lasting qualities for anthuriums, and plumerias aren't going to give us quite that lifetime. We picked our flowers the day they were open, put 10 in a sealed plastic bag. We held them at 8 degrees centigrade, which is about 40 degrees. And each day we would evaluate them for the keeping life, things like browning, tip curl, and withering. And we calculated an average daily life or half-life for these, these flowers. So 
So we have some of the plumeria varieties that will last 12 or more days when they're held in a uh, humid bag. And we have some that will only last a few days when they're held in a, uh, enclosed in a bag. Celadine, which is one of the most popular ones used by the, the lay flower trade, uh, has that kind of lasting quality. And then we have a number of other ones. I would point out Elena down towards the bottom of that list. It's one of the few whites that we have good lasting qualities. Most of our whites will turn brown quickly and because they're a thin petaled type of flower also will tend to wilt out quickly. Another fairly good one was the variety that we named for Donald Angus who gave us our start with uh, some funding in the early stages of our anterior uh, plumeria work. We were curious as to why some of our flowers were not lasting so well. And thanks to the efforts of Dr. Robert Paul and our department, we were able to run some ethylene production studies and learn that celadine doesn't produce a lot of ethylene, whereas Manoa Beauty did. And that's another of the contributing factors to a good, what you might call, keeping life for the plumerias. We have a lot of plumeria hybrids. Most all of these are of the genus Plumeria rubra. And the Plumeria rubra types with the mainland hobbyist collectors, there's over 600 named varieties. In Thailand, there are a lot of Plumeria pr producers. And interestingly, they got their start by bringing in cultivars from Hawaii in the first place. Well, one of the disadvantages to Plumeria rubra is that it gets a lot of rust. And that rust, if you walk through the uh, orchard of Plumeria trees, you'll wind up with little orange epaulets on your shoulders from all the rust. We have a lot of species types of Plumerias that are, some of which are rust resistant within the Plumeria obtusa group. But the only research that has been done combined all of the, uh, these varieties under Plumeria obtusa. So we still think that there should be some splitting out of these species types because some of them have quite different characteristics from others that are lumped with them under the obtusa. So one of my recent projects was to get a graduate student interested in looking at what the relationships might be. We did the DNA fingerprinting, you might say, of plumerias. So all of the species types, except for rubra, are white with a yellow throat. We have a great assortment, some of which would make good landscape plants, if they're not good lay flowers, such as the tiny ones in the top row or the thin petaled ones in the lower row. But one of the interesting characteristics for us was that some of these species are resistant to rust. And so with the DNA fingerprinting, we hope to be able to separate out which ones were which, and then be able to do the hybridization work to bring rust resistance into the colored ones. Plumeria caracasana, which is a native to Venezuela, it's been subsumed under the species named Pudica, but we think they are different particularly since we grow them in our situation. And it's very good, it sets seed readily. The flowers are small, not particularly outstanding in terms of their qualifications, but the plant is rust resistant. And it's a good sturdy plant, produces heavily, and produces for a long season. So it's one that we are looking at as a possible uh, parent plant for some hybrid work with plumeria. 
Plumeria stenopetala, which has very narrow petals, not particularly outstanding for cut flower work, but interesting in the landscape because it has an interesting growth habit of rather spreading and small stemmed. And it also is one that is rust resistant. The Plumeria obtusa variety Sericifolia has fuzzy leaves. And these also are rust resistant. Then two of the varieties that we have that are named, a variety called Isabella, which we don't know the background because it was given to us by a uh, salesperson from Louisiana who collected it from somebody in Florida who didn't know where they got it. But it is a magnificent plant for the landscape, it sets seed very readily, and it is rust resistant and a beautiful dark green. I mentioned the San Germain plumeria, which came to us from Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, great fragrance, also rust resistance, and again, a kind of different foliage type from the Plumeria rubris that we've come to know as our, our standard Plumeria for lay flowers. We had a, a student intern from uh, Thailand a few couple of summers ago who did a Plumeria rust study and we tried several different compounds. Uh, we tried biocontrols such as uh, Bovaria and the new uh, biofungicide called Howler, as well as the standard rust fun fungicide Heritage. Heritage, of course, gave us the best control, but we did get some control from the Howler uh, bacterial biocontrol. This diagram is actually a section of a slide that one of my graduate students made for us that illustrates the floral biology of the plumeria. In the middle, you see the pistillate structure with the stigma style and the ovules. The anthers are mounted off the petals just above the uh, stigmatic surface. And on the upper right-hand corner, you can see plumeria pollen grains that are germinating. And you can get a lot of pollen grains, but they have to make it through a very narrow throat down to the stigmatic surface of the uh, plumeria. My graduate student who did this work measured the lengths of pollen grains, percent germination of pollen tubes, and found that Yes, we had the potential to get pollen that would land on the stigmatic surface and grow down to the ovules before the flower fell off. Most of the times the plumeria flowered, if we were working with them, don't last the 12 days that we had in the keep equality study. But we haven't yet been successful in manual transfer of pollen, even though it was done 50 years, 50, 60 years ago by Bill Moraney on Kauai. Different varieties of uh, the plumerias had different amounts of pollen grains per flower, again, by my graduate students' counts. Karakasana, which seems to have a low pollen count, still has a high seed set. Pudica, which has a low count, has a low fruit set. Celadine sel seldom sets flower uh, fruits for us, nor, nor does Lay Rainbow, nor does Pops, but they have great pollen counts. One of the things that we found, and if you look back at that original graphic about which plumeria varieties set a lot of flowers, the ones that set a lot of flowers also don't seem to set a lot of seeds. So we have some, some challenges for some future plant breeders. This is the working part of the plant. The left-hand image shows the uh, stigma and part of the style and ovules. 
and it shows a bit of the anthers above the, the pistol. And then the middle shows the anther structure and then the ovary structure down below, which unfortunately got broken off in the process of making this image. One of our amateur plumeria breeders uh, said that they used a little piece of plastic kind of uh, shaped like a pine needle. They would stick down the throat of the plumeria and twirl it around and they got good pollination. Well, that's true. They were getting self-pollination and because of this, they grow out a lot of seedlings and they get quite a diversity of, of progeny, but they're not really getting cross-pollination. So the technique that I've been trying right at the base of the flower where it joins to the stem, we cut a ring around it using a sharp point such as an X-Acto knife and that causes the latex which is in the, the stem to ooze out. If we didn't do that, when we cut the flower off, it would ooze out and cover the stigma. So we have to what I might say, bleed the, the, the plant first. And then we have to strip the petals off so we can get to the anthers. And then we can take the anthers off and we can apply them directly to the stigma or we can take a tiny brush, take the pollen off the anthers and then apply it to the stigmatic surface. We've also tried <coughs> solutions in which pollen has been uh, in placed in a uh, pollen germination solution using a hypodermic needle, apply that to the uh, stigma. So far, we haven't had success. I think it just takes <coughs> more activity, finding the right time of day for the pollinations. <coughs> Some of the amateurs say it needs to be done in the morning. Well, we'll see. We've also done some work <coughs> with the, excuse me, also done some work with the Moraney hybrids that were developed back in the 1950s. This work was done by Dr. Alan Miro in Florida at the USDA clonal germplasm repository. And if you look at the graphic in the middle of the screen, you'll see a lot of red, you'll see a lot of green, but not all of these are available or are representative of a cross. He got 283 seedlings, which seems to me to represent at least two different flowers. And this graphic with the amounts of red and green suggest that we have at least two different parents uh, involved. And whether he was getting selfing or whether he had an actual cross, he claimed that he used the cultivar Grove Farm and Kohala for his hybrids. And those are represented in this slide. Finally, the DNA fingerprinting that my graduate student, Kawahi Perez, did she achieved her PhD a couple years ago. And we found that we can separate out some of these different species. And she's done a whole dissertation on this that so is much too complicated to make as a presentation. But it symbolizes some of the last research that was done over this 50 year period. I would say that initially we had couple of bulletins prepared. Now all of our information is online. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank Glenn for his introduction. And are there any questions? Yes, we do have a question, Dr. Crowley. If you can step on it, do you want? Sure. Um, on, that, on the X right there. Would you like some water? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is, there's been interest on the internet recently about some plumeria cultivars with purplish tones. Have you seen these in the local trade? No. 
the folks in Thailand have selected from fields of hundreds of plants. Mm -hmm. They have selected some that have lavender to purplish type flowers. Mm -hmm. We were actually trying to work with Hark to develop some uh, purplish ones because they had gotten some uh, genetic constructs in for trying to develop purple anthuriums. Mm -hmm. And we thought while they were busy inoculating these poor anthuriums, we could do the same with plumerias. Unfortunately, the anthuriums had the money, the plumerias didn't. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for still researching plumerias after all these years. Thank you. Thank you.